We live in an age of data obsession. Everything is data-driven. On organizations, what is the impact? We are speaking with Rishad Tabakwala. Rishad, you've written this excellent book. It's called Restoring the Soul of Business. Tell us about the Blues Group and tell us about the book that you've written. Right now, I continue to be at the Publicis Group as a senior advisor, but I have spent my entire 37-year career at either Publicis or a predecessor company that they bought called Leo Burnett, the uh, advertising agency. I have basically done pretty much anything that can be done in the world of marketing and advertising. I have worked in creative agencies like Leo Burnett. I have worked in media companies like Starcom and Zenith. I have been the chairman of big digital agencies like Digitas and Razorfish. I have worked in the corporate role as both the chief growth officer and prior to which I was the chief strategist of the Publicis Group. And I've also started a lot of companies for the uh, company, uh, small companies that scaled up into bigger companies like Starcom, IP, Giant, Step, and Denu. So how did you evolve from being a data person to writing a book that, is it fair to characterize it as the, the danger of being overly obsessed with data? Is that a correct characterization? The book's central premise is that individuals, companies, and teams do best when you combine the story and the spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet of a business is the data of the business. Uh, obviously, it's the P&L, the customer information, all of those things which are left brain, mathematical, computer-wise. Computer uh, the right side of the business, which I call the story of the business, is the purpose, the values, the meaning, the culture, the way people communicate in a business. And Successful companies need to combine both. So when you basically tilt towards the left, and what I was beginning to see over the last five, six years, because of the prevalence of data, because of the uh, rise of companies that were fueled by data, I was seeing businesses tilting more and more towards the spreadsheet versus the story. And I began to realize that there were three big problems because of that. The first was, more and more of the employees of companies were getting disengaged because when decisions were being done by math and machine, they felt left out. That was number one. Number two is that because of that, people were starting to make big mistakes. For instance, uh, Wells Fargo decided that opening accounts was what they needed to do. And so people began to open fake accounts. And at the same stage, now you understand that somewhat the same issues happened with Boeing when they had to get the 737 MAX you know, out there. So when you begin to have companies where it's all about let's make the numbers work or let's make the math have a decision, you also began to have stock market issues. So the company's market valuation dropped. And the third, from a societal impact, especially when you have larger companies like let's say today a Facebook, uh, they focus so much on their own, I would say, results and of fixating on consumers, they forgot that they have societal impact, which is we, have, we are not just ingesters of things. We are, you know, we are citizens of countries. We are parts of community. And so there was this backlash against companies who were only focusing on the left brain, as there's been a backlash on Facebook, as there's been backlash on other companies. So my thought was, let's restore the order and recognize that it's about story and spreadsheet. And spreadsheet only doesn't work. On the other hand, we are living in an age of technology and data, and story only also doesn't work. And a company that is all story and all making up stuff without a spreadsheet is WeWork. Right? So on one end, you can basically have all about, hey, this is a new world order, and it's all about community. Doesn't work or spreadsheet doesn't work. So you have to combine the two. So the book is let's get back to combining the spreadsheet and the story, and that is what the soul of a company is. Spreadsheet, we can say, is data. Is there a word that you would use to sum up the, the story side? Humanity, human. The reason I believe that is the following. Uh, data is very important as we live in a data-driven silicon and digital world. On the other hand, you and I, until the singularity, are carbon-based analog feeling people. 
we make decisions with our hearts and we use numbers to justify what we just did. And as a result, the story part of, the, of it is what humans feel and humans think and humans hope. And therefore I call the story part the culture of a company, the emotions of a company, and the talent of a company. Aren't businesses, managers in business to make money? And that's about it. There are two philosophies. And as you know, I am speaking from Chicago and I'm a graduate of the University of Chicago Business School. And Milton Friedman famously basically said, the only reason companies exist is to maximize shareholder value, which was number one. And the Chicago School of Antitrust basically said, antitrust doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is whether it impacts the consumer badly or not. Now, since then, two things have basically begun to happen. First is the Chicago School has adapted. And they just recently had a major event in 2019 where they basically talked about saving capitalism from the capitalists and about the fact that competition was being eroded, which was one, but more important and specifically to your question, they also now basically believe that sometimes the best way to make money is to actually focus on something besides the scoreboard. The way I look at it is business has three key things. It has a customer, which is what I call the ball, a player, which is the talent, and the scoreboard, which is the P&L. If you only manage the P&L, you lose focus on the ball, which is the customer, and you lose focus on the talent. I truly believe the reason like people like Larry Fink at BlackRock are now asking people to focus on the citizen versus just the consumer is because it is good for business. Because people actually care about the values of a company. Talent decides what company to join or not join, especially talent that's very difficult to get on what the values of a company are and whether it's a good environment and a good culture. So my basic belief is if you want to make more money, you have to pay attention to the humanity of both your customers, of your employees, and of basically your clients. Otherwise, you actually will be focusing on the scoreboard and you won't have any clue that the game has changed and the ball has not become a ball and everybody has left the court. But isn't the role of data to help you understand the nature of change, one role of data to help you understand, help one understand the nature of change and therefore discern the types of disruptions that may be happening around, around oneself and around the company. Absolutely, so again, the book is about how to, how to have data plus the story, but in the chapter on data, what I do believe is data is, that's exactly what it is, data. A higher level of data is information. A higher level of information is insight. But the highest level of it all is meaning. So my opening chapter is called Too Much Math, Too Little Meaning, right? Now, just so that you know, besides this degree in finance and marketing from the University of Chicago, I have an advanced degree in mathematics as my undergraduate degree. So I'm all, I'm all pro data, pro math, pro everything, right? However, just having numbers doesn't mean you have meaning. You have to basically do certain things. So my basic belief is I saw people misread numbers or not actually understand what the numbers were. So in the book, I talk about six eyes, which is not like six eyes, like six noses, but the letter I. And one of them is how do you actually interrogate the data? There are too many people who basically say, yes, what the data told me to do. And I say, give me a perspective of why you say so. Give me something provocative, which tells me that maybe the data is wrong and then give me a point of view on how I should use the data and what it means. That's what we have to do and that's what humans bring, right? The data never gives you the answer and if the data itself gives you the answer, which it does in things like trading and a whole bunch of other stuff, then in effect, you will not have a job. So whenever someone says, the data and the spreadsheet told me to do this, I say, thank you very much, please make sure you get a new job on your way out because I don't need you anymore. I can read the numbers as well as anybody else. I interviewed, as part of CXO Talk, Kathy Engelbert, who is currently the commissioner of the Women's NBA, and she previously was the CEO of Deloitte, together with Alicia Tillman, who is the chief marketing officer of SAP. 
And Kathy Engelbert said they were talking about women in technology. And she said that when companies look at spreadsheets, it hurts women. And I think it's a perfect example of what you were just describing. Yes, because you must recognize that in most cases, spreadsheets as well as current state of machine learning is backward looking, right? And innovation and change and hope comes from being forward looking. I often tell people, if you are stuck in a spreadsheet, you are stuck in a cell. That's really interesting. Can you elaborate on that? Spreadsheets and the uh, machine learning today are backward looking. Right, because in effect, machine learning is training people, right, and training machines on a whole bunch of data. The data has to be backward looking because you don't have forward looking data because the future has not happened yet. So machine learning has two things. A, it's backward looking, and B, as was mentioned by, and I, 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 I uh, quote her in my book, but there was this lady who basically said, that in many ways, an you know, a algorithm is nothing but opinions embedded in code, okay? And there are human beings behind this. It's not like some machine wrote the algorithm. So what you basically begin to happen is again and again you're seeing backward biases, backward biases either because it's the past or the bias of the algorithm writer. And in the United States, the algorithm writer is more likely to basically be a young to middle-aged white man. And so to a great extent, we are embedding the dreams and hopes of the middle-aged white man, which is why they want to sit at home, watch television, and have food delivered to them. So you have lots of delivery services. This shapes so much of our world, and it's hidden. We don't see it. It is one of the key things that I basically, in my six eyes, in addition to sort of you know, interrogating the data and interpreting the data and investigating the data, I ask people to do three other things. The first one is imagine if the data was wrong or what else the data is saying, which is bring yourself into it, which is number one. Number two is please be inclusive. Get other people to look at the data because if you only have a few people looking at the data, they may not actually see things. You know, there are these famous Pepsi commercial where they basically thought that giving someone Pepsi would solve Black Lives Matter, if you remember that. I have no doubt that everybody in the room either was Caucasian or if there were anybody who was African American, they were not given the opportunity to speak, right? So one of the key things I also talk about data and the reason why diversity or inclusive is important is we are living in a world which is multicultural, multipolar, and global and we better get used to it. There's nothing you can do to stop it, right? But in that particular world, having diverse faces is not the same as having diverse voices. And a big part of it is because data can be used as a weapon, we have to be very, very careful because I know how powerful it is. My whole stuff is we have to basically include other things. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll go, you know, it'll go rogue on us. We have a question from Twitter. Arsalan Khan makes the comment that a holistic approach to business is very important considering the societal impacts. However, what about monopolies and duopolies, which have no interest in being holistic and yet at the same time have a tremendous impact on our lives? The areas where we are seeing sort of a monopoly type of existence are really in the technology platforms, right? So the, the way I look at it is if you look in the United States, uh, you basically have three monopolies. Or, uh, and, and of course, they all define themselves differently, but the reality is you've got three sort of monopolies. One is the monopoly of information, which is if you're looking for information, Google is the place you go. The other is the monopoly of communication because the FTC was asleep you basically have Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram all owned by the same company, which is a monopoly of communication. The third is you're increasingly having in the United States the monopoly of transaction, which is Amazon, right? They can talk about what percentage they have, but as a book person, 55% of my sales and 55% of all books are sold through one person. If I can't keep the algorithm on Amazon happy, it doesn't matter what I did. That's a problem. That's a problem. So what happens is, 
That is one of the reasons why you're beginning to have a backlash happening today where people are beginning to ask, what has happened with these platforms? Now, interestingly, inside these places, like for instance, inside Google, people themselves are protesting, right? And what we have to basically understand is we should not allow any particular company to ever become so powerful because we are no longer looking backwards. We're looking at a future where these companies and what they do, these are not advertising operating systems. They run society operating systems. To what extent do you think organizations, and is this necessary, uh, sacrifice profit and potentially even revenue in order to make balanced decisions that affect the broader welfare? In my book, I mentioned company after company that has basically made those decisions and have tended to be more successful than any other company. So an example that I use, and I, you know, the CEO of this company actually has been one of the people who've endorsed my book, is Adobe. So if you look at basically Adobe, they have a culture which pays, pays attention to both the people and the technology. Uh, they do amazing things, which I've sort of understood inside. But also think about the fact that Adobe made two or three decisions that were so significant and seemed so stupid, which turned out to be fine. So right now, if I understand right, Adobe has basically overtaken both Oracle and SAP in market cap. And if you think about it, seven, eight years ago, when they made a decision to go all in on cloud, their revenues fell and their stock price fell dramatically. Uh, and I think it was like 20 bucks, 25 bucks or something like that. Now it's like 275, right? So my whole basic belief is the math told you not to do that. Leadership and imagination of Shantanu Narayan and his team told them this is where the future was going. IBM failed to do that. They did it. Oracle didn't do it as much. And so my belief is, if I look for leadership, I look for people who understand the trends. He obviously understood the data. He understood what was going on. And then inspires people to make changes and does amazing things. So similarly, when you think about it, Disney is going to lose money over the next two, three years. Definitely the direct business of Disney because of their decision to invest humongously on Disney Plus and on Hulu, on an ESPN Plus, to take back all the revenue that they were getting from licensing their stuff to Netflix. What happened? Their stock price started going up. So my whole basic belief is if you actually think world-class leaders don't understand that it's combining the two, then you wouldn't have amazing companies. Every company that fails is a company which has a leader that only uses the numbers. Aren't you really saying that, well, you know, it's this kind of magical, ephemeral quality that's really important. It's like creativity, but it's hard to bottle it. So how do we scale that? There are many ways to scale it. And, you know, one way is to potentially to read my book, because what I basically did was I identified the ways you can actually scale that. And I'll give you a few of them. The first is you've got to basically have companies where people can actually speak up and speak truth to power. So I call that chapter the turd on the table. Organizations that allow people to speak up are organizations that scale humanity, ideas, and innovation. How do you do that is called the turd on the table. The second is spreadsheets don't change. And the entire idea when people talk about I'm doing an M&A to change and transform my company, I say no. The only way you can transform a company is either you upgrade the people or you change the people, period, over and out. Everything else is a goddamn press release, right? And so what happens is you have to realize that change sucks, that people hate change. So if you want to scale change, you've got to begin and understand that change sucks and how do you manage change. So turn on the table is one. Change sucks is a second one. The third one, which we are failing to understand, which is my previous point, is all of society, and I, 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 you know, and I, I watch what I eat and I exercise, but we are fixated on food and exercise. But what separates us from monkeys is not our goddamn stomach, it's our minds. So why aren't we thinking about something more than our physical operating systems? Why aren't we upgrading our mental operating systems? In a world where we're in the 10th operating system for Mac OS and the 13th one for iOS, how come human beings are barely at number two? So another chapter is how do you actually 
upgrade your mental operating system, which includes training. So my belief is turn on the table, chain sucks, right? Upgrade your mental operating system, are scalable ways the most successful companies have made change happen. Human beings scale and are more inspiring than any pile of data and numbers. And when you combine the two, they beat everybody. Just like take a great chess player with a machine, they'll beat any machine. Yes, the machine can beat the chess player today, but a chess player plus a machine will beat the machine. Upgrading the human operating system seems like a pretty large task and there are entire very large bodies of thought ranging from Hinduism to Buddhism, even Christianity. And I'm not meaning to take this in a religious direction, but my point is that making change is it not only sucks, but it's it's really hard. And so in a practical way, what what can business leaders do to help drive that kind of change at that level that you're describing? Basically say upgrading the mental operating system, because I'm not trying to upgrade all of humanity, which is a religious thing. So it's upgrading mental operating system. So in my upgrading mental operating system, I basically tell everybody, hey, look, these are the three th key things you can do. Spend one hour learning every every day. Right? The world is changing so much. Most people are going to work for 50 years. Most companies last for 15. You'll outlast three companies. So the reality of it is if you're not investing and in learning one hour a day, just like you're investing in exercising and fixating on food, you're going to be like outdated, number one. Number two is try to do one new thing every day. The only time we get alive is when we fall out of the itinerary of day-to-day -day rituals. Go to a new restaurant, walk in a different place, see something. And third, which is the most difficult and most important today because of technology's polarization, is build the case for the exact opposite of what you believe. I truly believe that if you cannot build the case of the exact opposite of what you believe, I don't think you even know why you believe what you believe. So those are three things that are just very simple. Anybody can do right away to upgrade their mental operating system. Similarly, when it basically comes to chain sucks, first identify and recognize that chain sucks and therefore recognize it'll take much longer because you are dealing with humans. There's fast change. Fast change basically happens with fashion. Slow change happens with humans, right? And so one is talk to humans, repeat, figure out how that gets done. But most importantly is this, incentivize change behavior. Do not punish people when they change. What tends to happen is I see again and again Companies basically talking about change and then incentivizing today's results, incentivizing people who run today's companies, incentivizing people who have power based on client relationships of today. If you want to do something different, don't put out a press release, change your incentive plans. In order to uh, incentivize change, it means that uh, leadership must have clarity about the nature of the change that they're trying to accomplish without mixed feelings about it. And this seems uh, relatively rare. It is, because there are two things that they also need to do. So one is, as it's very famous, there's a, there's a uh, the previous CEO of Best Buy was basically asked what his thoughts were about change management. And his answer was yes, right? And to a great extent, Management, if they don't upgrade their own minds, they should get out. So in many companies, management is the issue. It's not the people, right? They lay off the people, but they don't know what they're doing, which is number one. Second is this, and I'm gonna use a couple of mental health terms, and the, neither of them, when I use this, is to in any way think that these mental health things are not very important, but I'm gonna use it because of a book that Andy Grove wrote. So Andy Grove wrote a very famous book called Only the Paranoid Will Survive, right? One of the reasons I think Intel has had its problems is because it, in a connected and collaborative world, it saw everybody as competition. You cannot in today's collaborative, connected world basically believe you can do it alone and have a hedgehogs or a you know, porcupine strategy where everybody sucks, right? Microsoft used to have that till Satya Nadella came up and basically said, let's have a growth mindset and let's figure out that Windows is the past, right? And the cloud is the future. So what basically, basically begins to happen is one is don't think about paranoia. I believe, and this is the way businesses should succeed, is in the future, it's not the paranoid will survive, only the schizophrenic will thrive. 
And what I mean is you need to run two business models. Every CEO has to deliver enough numbers today in order to keep his job, keep the stock price up, and attract talent, without a doubt. But he also or she has to run a model optimized for tomorrow. The problem is those two models are very different. They require different people, different measurement systems, and different incentives. And what they try to do is they try to put them together, which means they don't do today well or tomorrow well, and they do this horrible slushy of ideas. My background is with the enterprise software business. And during the transition from uh, on-premise software to cloud, this has been a real uh, problem for many established software companies because they're running two business models. They have the on-premise business model, and now they have to adopt the cloud business model. And making the transition and running these two business models which also is, in a, in a way, is what happens with digital transformation in general. This is a very, very hard thing to do. It is a very hard thing to do, which is why running it schizophrenically basically says, it's so hard you have to be like mentally insane to a certain part, right? But you need two completely models, which sometimes means that you have a leader. Like for instance, if you think about it, Satya Nadella ran cloud, right? And Steve Ballmer ran everything else. <laughs> Everything else didn't work out that well. The cloud did. Uh, but what basically happened is you, you have to sort of recognize that sometimes you have the future leader of a company often is working in the slime. You know, one of my basic beliefs is the future comes from the slime and not the heavens. I have seen this again and again because I work with senior management and amazingly smart people. Eventually, they benchmark everything against each other. And my thing is being less pathetic than other pathetic people still makes you pathetic. Right. S similarly, you know, IBM did not see Microsoft. Microsoft did not see Google. Google did not see Facebook. You see this again and again and again. Right. Because people basically hang out together. They go to Davos, which I go to too. You know, they hang out there, and everybody basically, you know, s s blows kisses at each other, and they don't know what the hell's going on. So my stuff is if a senior management doesn't spend at least twenty percent of their time talking to people they don't know, go outside their industry they will have a nightmare coming. So step outside their, their comfort zone, clearly. Step out their comfort zone, and they have to think, because every time this happens, it's like, you know, Gillette taken on by Dollar Shave Club, right? Because Gillette and Shake basically thought the future was adding more and more blades, charging more and more money, so to such an extent that when you go to Walgreens to buy a blade, you, you feel like a goddamn shoplifter, because you gotta get somebody to open the thing for you, right? And, then, and, and so they hold, and someone basically came in and said, how many blades do you need? And here's Dollar Shave Club or Harry's. And wow, there we go. You have to write down your market cap. And by the way, the people at the PNGs, et cetera, of the world are so smart, they saw this. But their incentive systems, I even heard uh, one of the CEOs of uh, PNG, uh, you know, A.G. Laffley, saying he made a mistake because he basically made a decision on profit and losses. Right? Because let me assure you, all of these companies have amazingly smart people. They have amazing smart everything. But they then basically say, we can't do it because the numbers tell us we can't do it. And my whole stuff is, then what are you a leader for? A business leader recently told me that when a company has too much resource, too many resources available, that that can cause a set of problems in and of itself. And I'm thinking of the P&G example you were just describing. Yes, because here's what begins to happen is there are two types of scale. And this is the key thing that most businesses are struggling with, is what I call old scale and new scale. And successful businesses have to have old and new. You know, there's some people who say it's all new scale or only old scale. So let me explain that. I'm going to do it broadly in the world of sort of marketing, because it's a world I understand. But I think this is true across the world. So for old scale, it's scale of manufacturing, so you can bring prices down. Scale of distribution, so you, you, know, you can get yourself into the Walmarts, et cetera, of the world. Scale of resources, so that you can basically hire people. And scale of spending, because if you spend more money, you get better magazine placement, you get prime time, television commercials, et cetera. So those are old scale. I think those are still important, but less and less important, but not unimportant. New scale is scale of networks and data, scale of influence, and scale of talent. 
And the example I use is our older daughters. Now our do my daughters are you know, in their late 20s and early 30s. But as they were growing up, they were watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians. And I thought I brought them up wrong. And their mother was watching it too. And I said, what is this nonsense you're watching? And they said, these are successful business people. Please leave the room. So I said, OK. Then they sent me once a cover of, the, of For Forbes where Kylie Jenner was the fastest or youngest billionaire. right? And I just looked into the, her company and began to realize that she had built a billion dollar company. She sold 40% to Cody. And she had built it with the following scale. Her scale of resources was 55 people. Her scale of uh, manufacturing was everything was actually basically done by a company called Pure Beauty. Her scale of distribution was something called Shopify. And her scale of spending was 120 million Instagram accounts that she spoke to. New scale. And so my basic belief is new scale is the slime. I'm not calling those people slime. It's the future of slime. But if you only think about new scale, you get yourself into a problem, like Casper, right? Because all these direct-to-consumer companies, eventually what do they do? They run out of money because all their money, they're competing with each other and only Google and Amazon and Facebook makes money. Nobody else makes money. So you need offline and online. So companies like Warby Parker, et cetera, have figured that out and are doing it extremely well. Sal Rasa asks, how have the cultural and the change issues and challenges developed as, uh, as companies have become more and more data-driven over time? The three things that have happened is, one is that they have basically started having meetings about data versus about having meetings between people. So one of the chapters I basically say is have more meetings versus less meetings because I've, I got so fixated by all these time and management experts talking about you know, minimizing the number of meetings and only going to meetings where you can extract value, which is total and complete bullshit. None of them have actually worked in the real world, right? I basically believe the reason people are besotted with how bad meetings are because they're not meetings. They're basically groups of people gathered around display screens looking at numbers. That's not a meeting. That's basically like watching TV, but there's numbers on the TV. Okay, that's what it is. And, and, and I think a meeting is when two people or four people or five people look at each other and talk without an interface. And so one of the key things that we've basically figured out is cultures of companies are falling apart because of the following things. One is people are discussing data, and data is nice and clean. People are messy. Let's talk about people and cultures and feelings, which you have to do in a meeting without a screen. But the second thing to a great extent that I think data has unfortunately led to is, which is impacting culture, is a big part of what data has led to is let's reduce real estate, let's open into this open seating stuff, let everybody work in a distributed network and we work. And I'm a big believer in that for the following reasons, which is it allows people to work from home and therefore they can look after their families or their aged ones. It allows people who may not be able to live in, the, in, you know, in, in expensive places to be involved. So there's a lot of good in that, but there's also a lot of bad in that, and we have to find ways to offset that. The first is you never actually know the other person. You don't know whether they're actually paying any attention, right? And at some particular stage, the data-driven world simply basically says, cut costs. I've never seen a data-driven world that basically says, invest more in human beings, increase costs. So therefore, it can't be good. Because if I already know what the answer is, you don't have to show me the numbers. We have another question from Twitter, which is, in your book, you use the term being data myopic, myopic. And how can somebody recognize if their organization is data myopic and, ha and has these problems? A few thoughts on that. Are we asking data-driven questions or are we asking questions that data can answer? So my thing is ask a question. Don't necessarily just look at the data for the answer. Data can reveal challenges and issues and things you need to look at, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have the answer for it. So obviously, sometimes when you look at data, to your earlier point, it reveals certain things, but investigate that. That's number one. Number two is 
can you make sure that when somebody basically asks, should you ask, is this data for real? You know, one of the examples I use is, uh, I think, a gentleman at American Express saying we figured out that 80% of the data we were collecting was irrelevant and not valid. And in fact, the third thing I would basically say is make absolutely certain that if your company and the team around cannot add something more to the data than the data itself is another sign your data myopic. Uh, and, 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 and I always basically say to people, can you talk to me in English without a number? Why is all of this so important to you? You were a data-driven guy, a mathematician. Why is this so important? It was important because of the following reasons. The first reason it was important is my job is to help my clients and my job is to help my, you know, grow teams. And what I was beginning to realize is my clients were making decisions that I thought were wrong and I started looking to prove to them that I was right and they were wrong and that was how I started. So first of all, it was like, hey, this is, I gotta keep my clients in business, this is what I gotta do, which is number one. Uh, not that they needed me, but just they need, you know, need some advice, so I would give that to them, that was one. The second, it was this. I am fixated on the fact that successful companies only work because they've got a superior share of great talent. And there was a number I read, which is in the book, which is 56% of people in the United States are not engaged at work. And so my thing is, what do we, if we can improve that 56%, isn't that better than almost anything else we can do in cost savings and other kinds of stuff? And what I realized is the reason the 56% was not engaged at work is because either they, that, that all agency had been taken away from them because they were just reading data. They were treated like cogs in a machine, right? They were treated as basically manufacturing units, you know, as, as people, not with people with dreams. And th what they were looking for from work, in addition to fame, money, and power, which many of us look for, right? What they were also looking was, they were looking for growth. Could they grow? They were looking for connections. Can they connect to other people? They were looking for purpose and meaning and values of their companies. And what I was beginning to realize is smart companies were beginning to have a big ta problem attracting talent, sometimes just by paying them with money. And I said, look, my basic belief is, unless you have superior talent, you can't win, which is number one. Number two is companies that combine are doing better than companies that are not combining. So in both cases, fixating on data hurts my own company because we lose talent, or my clients get hurt and therefore eventually my company will get hurt because we only get paid by them. And so my whole thing was let's do that. Now I had two advantages, and which is why I'm now speaking. One is because I was a pioneer in digital and because of my undergraduate degree in mathematics and my MBA, and because I'm Indian so people think Indians know how to do numbers, right? The general stuff is if this guy's talking, it's not because he doesn't understand numbers, doesn't understand data, and is like scared of it. And remember, my stuff is both. I keep saying both, not one, not the other. The second is over time I became senior enough and got enough of a reputation, and now I'm in a particular place, especially now that I'm an advisor, I can say what I think and nobody can basically fire my company. They can fire me, but I'm a company of one, which is fine, I'm already fired, right? So you don't have to worry, about, I'm not fired, but, but you understand. But what tends to basically happen is that there was a voice, and I was beginning to realize that this is not necessarily my voice, it's the voice of my clients, it's the voice of the people I've worked with, because when I sit with them, they said, this is what we really feel, but we're not in a position to say. So I'm now saying. We have a very interesting question from Twitter, and this is from Passionately Curious. And I'm just gonna read this, it's fairly long, okay? She says, AI, bi AI bias is rarely nefarious. It's flawed logic and overconfidence in math. Therefore, you should build into your processes algorithm bias audits that include diverse perspectives, cultural anthropology, and cognitive science. So it's both logic 
and psychological. I completely agree. That's the reason. That's the spreadsheet and the story. Uh, so the, the, the entire thing about too much math, too little meaning, I basically talk about bringing in diverse perspectives. And the entire, I have a chapter on algorithms, which I basically call robots compute, people dream. And unless you have the computation people and the dreamers together, our algorithms will basically be written for Silicon Valley who are disconnected from the reality of the world. Advice for individual contributors who are listening and saying, what do I do? How can I drive this kind of change? Because this makes sense. I would say do a couple of things. One is recognize that every single person is talented and you are a talented leader even if you are a company of one or you're an individual contributor. And ask yourself just the following five Ask yourself how you build these five characteristics very quickly. One is you gotta have capability. So you have to be good at something and not good at a whole bunch of things that are, you know, just one is be capability. The second is do you have integrity? Will people trust you? Because I believe trust is speed. What people are looking for is, and the, 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 the currency of the future is people who have trust. And the third, fourth, and fifth are about openness to other, which is are you empath empathetic? Can you inspire people and are you vulnerable? And if you have those five characteristics, you will be very, very successful. And if you want to know more about how to do that, that happens to be a chapter in my book too. My final question is, what advice do you have for business leaders who are watching this and they're saying, yes, this sounds great, what do I do? I think most business leaders and almost every business leader I have seen I have learned from because they're so smart. However, they have outsmarted themselves. They are anticipating something else. They're living in other people's minds. And I say, why don't you live in your mind? Why don't you live in your heart? Because instinctively, I think most business leaders know what the right thing to do is, but they're imagining that someone else is telling them to do something else. So don't follow the siren song of somebody and clash your company against the rock, believe in yourself. I find that strange in a way because when we think of business leaders, we think of self-directed, powerful, clear, and you're saying uh, internally driven, and you're saying that that's often not the case. It's not often the case because I often have the great opportunity of having drinks with these gentlemen and ladies. And after a couple of drinks, I ask them a simple question, what's bothering you? And the number one question is, the number one answer is, am I relevant for today. Number two is my company's business model relevant for today. And number three, which sometimes is number one because I'm there, is is your agency relevant for today? <laughs> right? But outside of the fact that they think I might be irrelevant and my company might be irrelevant, which is my problem to fix, the other two is their business model. But what I find surprising always is they always say whether they are relevant because they are doubting themselves because the world has changed so much. Those are essentially the existential questions. Are we going to be around for a long time? Yes. And my whole basic belief is we are not. So why don't you make time valuable? So in fact, as you know, the opening of my book called Why This Book simply says time is the only thing you have. So why should you spend any time with your book? And we forget this. I keep reminding people, whatever your age is, minus it from 80, 80, because around that you'll basically break down completely, right? Multiply it by 300 because for 60 days you may be like, you know, marijuana fog. And those are the number of days you got left. Then when people basically ask you to do things that take up your time, recognize you're giving up your life. My whole thing, as I keep reminding senior people, is the whole point of having money is not to make decisions on money. Why did you have so much money to still make decisions on money? You failed. I can tell you I have enjoyed spending my time with both the book and with you, Rashad. And thank you very much for taking your time to be with us today. And thank you for having me and for your audience to listen or watch. Thank you. We've been speaking with Rashad Tabakawala. He is the former chief growth officer of Publicis Group. And he's the author of this very interesting book. I'm trying to aim it so you don't see a shine. Restoring the Soul of Business, Staying Human, in the age of data. He's got a great message. Thank you to Rashad for the insightful conversation today. Everybody, before you go, please subscribe. 
on YouTube and subscribe to our newsletter. We have amazing shows coming up. Check out CXOTalk.com and we will see you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.